Welcome everybody to this webinar. This is a webinar on data-driven agriculture. As we can see in slide number two, if Dan can open slide number two, the webinar is facilitated by GFAR, the Global Forum on Agricultural Research and Innovation, and is co-convened with other two organizations, the Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition Initiative, GODAN, and the Technical Center for Agricultural and Rural Cooperation, CTA. Uh, this webinar, this series of webinars, because there will be more than one, is a follow-up on a four-day course that we had in Centurion in South Africa in November. Uh, and the, 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 web, the, the course was about different aspects of farmers' access to data. And we wanted to capture what was said during that course in a series of webinars so that it could be then uh, visible and uh, open to everybody. Uh, in this first webinar, our presenters, Dan Byrne, will give an overview of what data-driven agriculture is. Uh, who is Dan Byrne? First of all, Dan was one of the trainers in the course we had in Centurion, and he was the coordinator, actually, of the whole training, and he gave several presentations, and he also entertained the participants with a lot of activities. Uh, Dan is a professional business growth strategist with over 30 years of experience. And in particular, he's an expert in the irrigation sector. He worked for the Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance in the US, where he, he led the efforts to create an agricultural irrigation market strategy. And he also wrote several reports for NEEA. Uh, she also, he also serves uh, as the project manager on Ag Gateways Precision Ag Agricultural Irrigation Language Data Standards project called PALE. Uh, he will also, I mean, I, 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 th I think he will also say something more about what he does. And uh, I think I will give the floor to him now. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, thank you, well, Dan. Good, thank you, Valeria. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, wherever ever you are. And I'll just say that um, uh, uh, the reason I moved into this area uh, is just personally being uh, wanting to help with the challenge of feeding a hungry planet with fewer resources as, as time goes on. And I think a lot of you here have the same motivation. So hopefully we're all working towards some of the same goals. Uh, some of the topics we're going to go through is uh, what is data-driven agriculture and why does it matter? And where some of the trends are driving that. And uh, what are data uses across the agricultural value chain? Uh, we'll look a little bit at, so some of the data is on farm and some is off farm. And uh, how do you know which one to, to use? And there'll be issues and challenges that we'll, we'll go over in farm management information systems in general. And we'll go through a couple use cases with, with irrigation so you get a better sense. This is an overview. Uh, we have a lot to uh, uh, cover. So I'm going to actually try, to, uh, Valera, now to turn off my video and see if that does not mess up my, oh, it did not, good. So we're, we're gonna go. And as uh, Valera said, if you have questions, please put them into the chat and then we can cover those uh, as best we can at the end. All right, so data-driven agriculture. Uh, it's really the thoughtful use of big data. And big data means that you're scooping up a lot of data, uh, whether it's about the weather, whether it's about your soil, whether it's about uh, your farm ec economics, whether it's about the market, and, and really using it to supplement on-farm what we call precision agriculture. So precision just means that you're using, uh, you're using some type of equipment or, or machine where you've fed in some, some data, you've done some analysis to say, this is the best way that we're going to uh, farm during a season. So it's the right farm data at the right time to help farmers make better, better decision. And I like what Andre Lapierre said, it's not just the binary numbers, it's what you do with the data that counts. So we talked a lot about um, uh, moving from, from data to information, to knowledge, and using the wisdom that farmers have to really make some better decisions. And why is this going on? Well, there's a lot of, uh, this is just increasing uh, the amount of use of data uh, and really is, has to do with uh, the cost of supply chain. So getting food uh, from the field uh, into uh, processing and eventually to the consumer. And that is uh, companies and the whole uh, agricultural value chain is looking to decrease those costs. 
uh, your participation in globally competitive markets. So as you move out of your local area to, to more global markets and increasing the need for traceability from farm inputs to the end consumer. Consumers wanting to know, so where did this come from? Uh, and then smarter use of natural resources, especially water, land, and soil nutrients. And for those of you who are now experiencing uh, uh, drought conditions or flooding, you know exactly what, uh, what these challenges can offer. And that has to do with the more unpredictable and, or extreme aberrations of weather uh, due to cli climate change, which is a big driver. So, you know, we're seeing everywhere we can have extreme pre precipitation and soil erosion. We can have increased droughts. We can have increased floods going on maybe at, at the same time in, in different areas. But mainly it's the variability in weather patterns are changing. It's hard to say what, what's going on uh, month to month where before we might be able to predict uh, a, a little bit better what the more climatic changes are, are going to be uh, over the years. And that brings more weeds, diseases, and pest issues uh, and significantly adjusting crop plants. We have, where I live, we have wine grape growers uh, way up in the northern part of the United States who are asking themselves, wow, if this, uh, if it continues to warm, should I be thinking of tearing out the grapes that I have and bringing in some uh, plantings from California way to the south? So it means increased risk, higher costs and prices, and then challenging to tie outcomes to, to causes. So really the key word is uncertainty. It's driving a lot of what people are saying. If I can get a hold of more data, maybe I can sort of be more certain about what to do. And so we're seeing a really increase of uh, digital um, aspects across the farm. So, so historically, we've gone to just having, I might sell you a product, which is a tractor, but now I'm going to add uh, a little monitor on it and, and maybe then make it connected so that we can uh, steer that, that product without a, a human being in it. Maybe we're going to add a yield monitor onto the, to the, the tractor. Maybe we're going to add a software program that says how, how to seed it. So we start to combine it with the, maybe a planter or how to harvest it. Uh, and, and so that sort of has been the state today, just connecting, making products, individual products uh, smarter and then trying to get them working with other products that connect directly to them. Now we're moving into companies uh, and the industry as a whole is looking at this as a whole system. So you have a farm management system which is trying to collect all of the data. Now, all that data may be partly on the farm and partly off, off the farm, but somehow it has to be collected and analyzed to, to, together and then use with farm equipment systems uh, work to optimize your seeding, work to optimize your irrigation, and then point in uh, uh, information from different weather data systems. And we'll go into more uh, d detail about that. But it's really the industry is trying to see this more as a whole system where before it was just individual parts, individual pieces of equipment. And so our data-driven decisions and, and activities. So part of those are have to do with how do you till, if you till at all, uh, what crops do you plant, what seeds do you plant, what varieties of that seed do you, do you plant, uh, when and how much to, to irrigate, uh, uh, how to seed, uh, the amount of fertilizer that you use, when should you harvest? And, and even down to things like, well, I'm getting, I'm expecting some flooding, maybe I need to add some drainage tiles. Uh, but the main, the main, so the main data activities to support those would be spatial or terrain analysis. So looking at the contours of the, uh, of the land, looking at uh, how, that, how that happens on your farm. And that tends to ha happen once, the more seasonally then would be soil analysis, particularly around not just what kind of soil you have, which doesn't tend to change a whole lot, but the moisture in the soil tends to change very often. And then of course, monitoring the weather and looking at variable rate application, whether that variable rate is with seeds or with water or with fertilizers or other inputs onto your crops. And of course, record keeping of what is going on because we're seeing also an increased need for uh, uh, from, from from governments and just from a, a sense of wanting to have a more sustainable practice, keeping better records of what is going on. 
So other uses include, you know, you might use your, your data to, for your own expense tracking and your return on, on investment. So if you, buy, uh, if you buy a piece of equipment that costs you a bit of money, how do you know that you're getting your return on that? How do you, how do you, how do you look at that? Um, you might, some people use it to uh, map their herds and flocks, whether they are using that with monitors, whether they are using that with maybe a drone uh, to fly over and, and see where their, where their herd is. Uh, and crop mon monitoring, uh, that might be again with sensors, it might be with uh, uh, imagery, uh, field operations alerts and actions. So perhaps your, your crop is being stressed, there are sensors today that can give you an alert about that. And of course, we've talked about autonomous operations of equipment, yield and profit forecasting. So how do you how do you predict what your profit is going to be? If we've talked about before tracking and tracing, and you may be involved in a government pr program and they certainly always want data. So this is how the, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We'll go more into this in our, in, in, in the next in, in a webinar uh, in March. But basically, this is how, if you look, talk to the people in the industry, this is how they line it up. This is how they are viewing it. So they are saying, hey, we sell components and some of them sell auto automation and control systems. Some of them sell sensors and other mo monitors. Some of, and of course, we have to have wireless modules to get data to move from one place to another. And there's software that might be uh, uh, web-based or, or cloud-based. And then services, I might, sell you services on best use of your land or what your land looks like, climate modeling, weather, et cetera, as you can read down there. But it's really about uh, the more of the software services, the consulting, the in integration. How do you, where do you go to take all this data, put it together and have someone make sense of it for, for you? And a lot of it has to do with uh, the data collection and analytics. And they talk about ma machine learning, which means that you're trying to get machines like sensors and databases to learn more as they, as they collect more data. That's in early stages, but, but some interesting work going on there. And of course, supply chain management. And then that gets to where you probably intersect with this with an application. It might be you, you sign up to have someone map your field or analyze your soil, crop scouting, weather tracking, et cetera. And that's probably uh, the more often area that, that you are going to, to see it. And then also they obviously have to adapt for different regions that pe people are in. And all, the common denominator across that is data. Uh, people are also looking to integrate strategies across the agricultural value chain. So whether, uh, from production, and I would say input into, into that production, uh, harvesting and, and, and tra transport. So uh, there are areas for smallholder farmers uh, to play a role obviously in both of those. And then in primary processing and storage, maybe you do some of this on your farm, maybe you do some of this with a co-op, maybe you do some of this with a local processor, but there are, uh, there are mainly ways to, to track that, to uh, make sure that you are getting the right product to the right place and that you're getting, um, you might have variations in your product. Maybe some have um, moisture, higher moisture content and others not. Uh, so, and then secondary processing, distribution and packaging, and all the way to the retail market. Okay, so that means that you've got to share data um, across the value chain. So, it might be uh, uh, your supply inputs, maybe you have some equipment that needs uh, preventive maintenance and seeds. Uh, et cetera, uh, we talked about, you might have some imagery done by satellite or by drone, uh, definitely soil analysis. Uh, and you may, you know, if you're really a big farm, you might even have to manage a fleet of trucks. I don't think that's most of the case here. But production, right, Plan as we talked about, planning, irrigation, monitoring the field, harvesting and storage, key activities that people want to integrate the, da the data with so that when they get to market and post office, post harvest, they can see what is going on across that. And so that takes us into the transportation. Infrastructure investment might be, well, how much harvest are, are, are we getting? Do we need, uh, if I'm a big producer who, who's taking your harvest, do I need more trucks, for example? Do I need more insurance? Uh, how should we price this? 
how should we brand this? All of that. So they're so the so the market itself is looking for a whole bunch more integration than they ever used to before. And but for you, I think the focus should be around uh, three key areas: farm profitability. So they're really strategically using data to choose the right crops and markets, analyzing the, your costs and your margins, and managing the economic aspects of, of your farm. And with that being more, lower your costs and your time and your difficulty by being more efficient. And obviously reducing difficulty and add frust frustration. And that has a lot of work to do on the manufacturer side, making sure that you know, these data ser services, these pieces of, of equipment are easy to use and that they, they talk to each other. And there's still more work to do there in the, in the industry. And then sustainability, of course, managing your, your resources, uh, the, op the practices that you use for field operations, and then managing the social aspects of your farm as well to make sure that you are farming in a sustainable way. So, I, but I think job number one for farm management in information systems to help you be more re re resilient. They should help you respond to changing conditions, capture relevant observations and, and measurements, uh, and use the data for better planning. So when you go through one season, what happened? Can you improve that for next time? And manage your crop growth in real time and under changing field con conditions. So maybe get a very warm, dry, dry spell, or maybe get some flooding. How do you manage that? And earn more with up-to-date pricing and information. It's one of the, the uh, issues that came out when we were in um, uh, South Africa. It's hard to get good market data that you can trust. And then review, this, the, as I've said, review the results and improve for the next cycle and improve traceability as we talked about. And again, I mean, it really should help you as a small shareholder farmer move from just managing your plot to really managing your farm, managing your business and be a profitable owner of a sustainable business. At, at the end of the day, that's the end result that, we're, that we are aiming for. So, as we said, uh, data, so we talk about data, but it can be divided up. And you want to think about data in chunks. Uh, otherwise, it gets really overwhelming. And so data can be, um, you know, there's data that you generate on the farm. So what kind of crop are you growing? How much did you grow? What did you use as your input? How did you irrigate? How did you seed? All of that is, is uh, data that's generated on your farm. And then there's some that you get from outside. And this particularly um, could be things like uh, soil, soil terrain and weather are two big ones that you would get from the outside, as well as market con conditions and what's the pricing of your, of your crop. And then there's data that you generate as used outside your farm by either industry or the government. And we'll talk about this as one of the challenges. So when you send data up to maybe someone who's providing you uh, advice on how to seed, advice on how to irrigate, they have that data. And if they are getting it from other farmers, they are putting that data together in an aggregated way, and that has value. And that's one of the uh, one of the issues that we've talked about is how do we make sure that farmers also participate in that value. So off farm re resources, so the ones that are off farm. So open source, there's, we went through, um, uh, a list of different areas, uh, different uh, organizations that have open source soil and land capability maps. So they can tell you, this is what your soil looks like. This is what the terrain looks like. Here's some crops that would fit well with that, as well as uh, weather and climate data. And then there's some open source farm, farm management tools. Some might help you predict um, when you should harvest based on the crop that you are, are growing and what the season looks like in, in areas like that. So when we say open source, we mean that you can get them and they're free. And often they're done with the government. Uh, this is an example we looked at when we were in cr Criterion, uh, K Farm Mapper lets you look at agri uh, for a particular piece of an land, your agricultural practices, environmental management, et cetera. And, uh, and the issue is this is great for the K Farm area, but that's it. And this is an issue with a lot of these uh, open source ones that they are funded by a government and it might be a local government. So it only goes so far and yet has very rich information. So we have to figure out how to expand these over time. 
Uh, also, here's another one, Agristat's portal, uh, again, for the Western Cape. Uh, it gives you, um, it's got flyover in, in information, but that can give you a lot of good information about the land, about wind, uh, et cetera. Uh, weather and climate data, I just want to point out quickly, because people get these terms confused. So weather, we're talking about more near term. So it should affect your planting dates when you fertilize, your harvesting dates, and more the near time. But climate is the longer term term view, and uh, so that's going to affect your land your land management. It's going to variety of development, as we said, what kind of crops you plant because of changing climate conditions, not just season to season uh, weather. And again, what cropping systems are you, are you going to do based on that? So here's an example. This is uh, a program we have in the United States in the Pacific Northwest, again, local to the Pacific Northwest, but it's, it gives you uh, both daily forecasts and seasonal for, forecasts. And you can also go in there and look and say, well, what would be the impact of climate change uh, uh, if there's a high risk of it happening or a low risk? And it'll, it'll give you variations in what your daily uh, average temperatures would look like based on if you think that risk is high or, or risk is low. Um, one of the things I want to talk, I want to just mention is that here we use a combination of, uh, of weather input. So you might have a local weather station on your, on your farm, which is really local to your field. And, and then uh, a lot of the universities here have put weather stations out in different parts and these, the purple, uh, areas are where you see weather stations that are that are done uh, by people like Agrimet and so uh, or uh, a university with a weather net and then you can also go off farm to to larger um, weather and climate uh, providers and the idea here is that the more that you can put these two uh, these three together from very far away climate to regional to local on your farm then the more um, specific information you're going to have and actually better data you're going to have. Okay, so how's the data flow? If you're the grower, what are we talking about? Well, we're talking about you might have a crop plan, right? And you might hire an agronomist or a consultant or someone from the university or someone from the government to come help you. This may, the agronomist might be you. But you're going to say, okay, here's my crop plan. And from that, I'm, I decide what I'm going to grow. I'm going to go out and do some scouting. I'm going to get information maybe about my soil. Uh, maybe I'm going to have um, a, a drone flyover. But I'm going to get. I'm going to go out and dig some soil and send it for some some testing. I'm going to do observations around what the weather looks like, and so all that all that starts to inform you what your what your plan is going to be and how how you're going to execute it. And then the the agronomist or Maybe yourself, you make a, rec a recommendation. Okay, based on those observations and measurements data, I'm gonna I'm gonna grow my stuff this way. I'm going to irrigate uh, in this manner when this is the schedule. And so I might send. We're, I'm using an irrigation uh, as an example. So I might send a work order, which can be automatically uh, taken uh, sent over to an irrigation controller based on the data that you have. And you can actually send that as uh, a command, not to automatically start, but at least give a, rec a recommendation work order uh, uh, to either to turn on like a drip irrigation system for very large pivots. Uh, you would not use this to automatically turn those on because they're so big and you don't want anyone to get hurt. But that's it's the sa same idea. And then you can get a record. Uh, the data can be captured to give you a record, and then you can use to provide reports as you need to, either to your supply chain partners or to your co-op, uh, to the government as they need that. Um, so um, another um, aspect of data is that you want to be sure what you're doing with the data. So you can get, you can have, look at what happened, right? So you can look at back and say, huh, I had, I had this season, how much you, I was expecting this kind of yield, but I didn't get it. So what happened? Was it was it drought? Was it flooding? Did I not use enough fertilizer? Did I use too much? What happened? And and then you want to find out. So why did it happen? 
And that's where you start to get in using some more ex experts, uh, maybe some expert data systems to say why, and then also to say what will happen in, in, the, uh, in, in the future. So we expect that there's going to be a continued drought and it'll have this impact on your farm. And then you want to move up into pre prescriptive, which means, okay, so what do I do about this? Now we're going to go into this in a lot more detail uh, in the webinar in March. But again, here, here's an example of what uh, a, a group, uh, this came out of University of Nebraska, United States, they had a farm and they said, well, based on what we looked at at the soil and the soil moisture, uh, we, we would expect this kind of yield. And here the red is less yield uh, and less, less water. So what we actually got for crop yield is different from what we expected. And so next time would we want to change, we want to do something to change that distribution of water and why, why did that happen? There are inherent challenges. Uh, data systems want to aggregate. They want to, they, you know, data likes to come to, to together and make big data and bigger data and bigger data and bigger data. Farming is very location specific, as, as you know, it's your field, it's your farm. And your one field might be might different, one part of the field might be different. And no two growing seasons are the same. Climate change is disrupting, as we said, uh, what were once 10 to 30 year patterns, those don't quite exist anymore. And then if you're using different vendors, if you're using different manufacturers, they have their own systems and they often don't work together. They don't talk, talk to each other very well. They're working on it, but they have a long way to go. And we see a lack of expertise everywhere, uh, 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 whether you're in the United States or, or Europe, we need more experts out there to help farmers sort and analyze the data and make recommendations. And then we'll talk a little bit about data ownership and security. Um, open source tools, as I said, are limited to specific regions. So those ones I said were like for, for climate or terrain, often are, are lim limited to a very specific area. And the data itself can be hard to find. So where do I find this stuff? How do I know? It can be expensive and t tedious to get. It can be inaccurate and incomplete. It could be a, too late to be useful. It can be lacking critical met metadata and by that we mean so what's the context of this data what was so i get this weather report what does that mean and can be actually tedious to acquire and, and transfer so unless you're used to dealing with this and you you sort of know how to go onto your laptop or your phone and get this it can be hard and expensive to clean meaning sometimes the data doesn't come through very well and it it's it is incomplete or it just doesn't make sense um other barriers, interoperability outside of vertical solutions. By, by vertical, we mean by one cup company. And I'm gonna stop, someone has their, has their audio on. So if everyone could turn their audio off, that would be good. Um, and again, so we, we, we had those barriers. So data privacy, security, and ownership. Uh, there's data privacy, we talked a lot about this uh, when we were in South, South Africa. So if your data, if you're giving up your data on your farm to a third third party, maybe it's an equipment manufacturer, maybe it's someone who's providing you advice, whose data is that? How do you know it's gonna be private? Uh, how do you know that it came from where it was supposed to come? Is it, do you have integrity with that data? Are you secure from someone hacking, getting into your data and, and taking it? Who authorized someone? to use your data and what does that authorization allow them to do? Who owns this data? And the data has value. I will tell you right now, these are still big issues and there's not clean answers to them yet. We talked a lot about, yes, data has, has value. In the United States, data from farms is somewhat considered by property law and also a little bit by intellectual property law. And the difference with that is basically this. If you treat data from your farm as property, it tends to be more yours because it's, you own it as property, but uh, as, as physical property. Now, if you look at data as intellectual property as happens in Europe and as happens probably in uh, a lot of uh, Africa, it's harder to prove that that data, that you have any associative value with that, that data because someone else collected it added something to it and made it of, of value. 
So we are wrestling with this. And I think it's going to take some, some time to sort out exactly how do farmers get, uh, get compensated for the, how do you get compensated as a farmer for the data that you, you provide? It's, a, it's still a big issue. Okay, but the good news is there's several, um, there's several ways that you can easily use da data right now. Uh, uh, Moses Odeke, who was at our, who was a participant, uh, shared with us uh, from the Virtual Irrigation Academy, a very easy, sim simple to use irrigation moisture sensor. So this is data, folks. This is, this is what we mean by data. You're gonna put, you're gonna put probes in the ground. They're gonna read soil moisture. They're gonna give data back about what's going on in your soil. And they're going to say, "Hey, it's you got enough water in there, or no? Uh, uh, you need to ir irrigate, or whoa, you have too 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 much water. Don't water now." And it's really looking at salt and fertilizer ma management because those are big indicators about how how much moisture you, your plants need. And so, of course, as you know, you want to get the right amount of, of of moisture at the right levels for that plant. And so uh, uh, they use my my trust. Uh, nitrate test strips uh, to indicate the amount of nitrate. Now you might go like, so what? What does that, that mean? Uh, but here's here's what happens: is in their system, uh, they install, or you might install with, with some with some help the, the those moisture sensors. The data is collected, it's processed and sent up to uh, their database. Uh, it's hosted in, in in Australia, but any farm uh, who's signed up with the virtual irrigation. Uh, can uh, use it, then they say, oh, okay, here's some, here's, here's what you should do, and uh, you should either water less or water more. So you actually get real-time information, and again, in a very, very simple way that says, oh, green, everything's uh, good, blue or green, I should irrigate, red, no, blue, I have just enough moisture in, in the soil. So it's really a very simple, a very effective way to use data. Now we're going to look at a much more compl complicated one. This is put out a group by Crop Metrics, who here in the United States. They have a product which they call their virtual optimizer. This is an interface. It's taken in lots of things. They're, they're, they go out to your field and they do customized parameters, meaning that they look at what specifically is going on with your field. Uh, uh, they get um, uh, site-specific updates what's going on with the soil, with the weather, with real-time alerts. They have the soil moisture probes, uh, and they come up with it. They analyze it down to two feet, and they say, here's what's going on. Here's how you should irrigate throughout the season. So much more complex than the little soil moisture probe, uh, and this is useful if you have a lot of soil, soil variation. So here where I live in the Pacific Northwest, you might have soil that's part clay, part loam, part this, part that. So how you need to irrigate this, this, this field could be very different based on what part of the field you are standing in. Your field may not have that type of variation and would not need uh, so much of this uh, technology and data. And that's important. Uh, one of the things we always wanna look at is how much data do you need uh, and not be sold a whole bunch that you don't need. So they look at what we call the plant available water, right? And 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 you want to say, okay, uh, I don't want to I don't want to flood the field. I don't want to reach sat saturation point, but I sure don't want to get down to where my crop is going to wilt and I can't recover for that. So I want to hit into this area, and that's what their data does. So their soft so their moisture sensors collect the data from the field. They run it through their analyzer, looking at the crop. Uh, and then looking to say, okay, throughout out the season, what's the right amount of water based on what you want to do? And in some cases, we know here at least that more water does not always mean more yield. We have we can e easily prove that you can use less water and actually get higher yield because you're not over watering and you're giving water at the critical times as the season goes goes on. So you're looking at the soil uptake, the root development what that distribution lo looks like because it might be, again, different in, in one part of the field than the other. So much more complex, but if you need that because you're planting uh, a large crop over variation in field, it becomes very uh, useful for you to, uh, to get improved yield 
but also reduce your, your water and your fertilizer costs. And so again, they, it's a matter of having these multiple technologies working together to say, okay, I, I know all about the plant. I know when the critical water pairing is. I'm looking at the, the, the deficit of, of, of moisture in the soil. And, uh, I'm done, I've done my soil analysis to say what kind of soil is there. I've created a map of how I want to irrigate. This would be for a pivot irrigation, those, the, the circles. And the blue is I'm going to put a lot of water in this part, not so much over here. And it gets it's nicely, nicely fine-tuned, but uses a lot of data, including, as I said before, you might have a, you would need here, you would need a local weather station on, on your field, as well as the soil moisture probes. So very, uh, very complex, but it gives you what uh, it can look at the outgoing weather. Uh, forecast and say, okay, exactly when should we irrigate over the course of the season? So that leads us to where we are today. We're some people are calling this agricultural 4.0. As we talk about not just having data to drive equipment and individual uh, pieces like uh, monitoring the yield, it's putting a whole system to, together and, and this big data area. Well, as we just saw, it can be a really, really, really complex system, and no one has a handle on the whole thing. What we see is that big companies that you might be familiar with, so John Deere, um, certainly um, um, Monsanto, uh, uh, Syngenta, all of these companies are they're either merging together to buying up smaller companies because they're trying to get to an end-to-end -end solution for farmers. I think right now where we are is those are tending to be, one, they would like you to use just their product. Maybe you buy a tractor, maybe you buy, and then you buy everything else, else from them. So they're really looking to say, yes, we want to offer you the whole package, but we want you to stick just with us. And so they're competing, uh, constraints because trying to solve that end-to-end -end use by you, the farmer, that takes a lot of people, it takes a lot of investment, and uh, you can't, no one company can tackle the whole thing at the same, same time. So they're really trying to f figure it out. Um, I've talked with um, a lot of the companies, and they're making substantial investments in this t in data and egg technology, but no one's got a specific game plan yet. They're still trying to figure out exactly how they're going to move in, into this space. So that's just giving you a heads up that if someone t tells you they've figured it all out, I would have some questions for them because I'm not betting that's, that's actually what's going on. But again, there is, they're doing it because there's an increased need for tracking and traceability. And let's face it, farming is risky and they're looking for efficiencies in their own system uh, as we said, end to end across the value chain. Uh, one of the things we, we we talked about is that data not just has to be collected, it has to be sent. And it has to be sent between different operations. So you might have that soil moisture sensor uh, that we talk, talked about that um, uh, that Moses Adeki had introduced us to. That has to send us data, right, to that database in, Aus in Australia. But what if you have another kind of soil moisture sensor already, and, and you're just adding this? Can they both send the same kind of data in the same format? If they send it in different formats, that takes more time and often conflicts with e each other. So data standard groups work, works to say, okay, how can we make this data all look the same so matter what kind of sensor you have, what kind of tractor you have, whatever it is, whatever data is going on there, it's sending it in the same format. That's a great idea. The problem is there are many, 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 many data standards out there because different people have tried to track different aspects of this. So open egg applications group to uh, uh, ISO to Godan, Oh my heavens, uh, AEF has to do more with, with the tractors and the actual equipment. There are so many standards. And, and we've gone through this cycle of saying, well, you know, if only we had one standard to 
to make them all comply and we'll just have one big umbrella standard and what happens with that just becomes another standard. So, we're, so the industry is trying to, to, to not uh, duplicate where they can. Uh, I, I do work with a gateway here in the US and our first philosophy is don't duplicate a standard that's already out there. We wanna make it easy for farmers to, to use and share data. If there's a standard out there that already works, just promote that. So I'm showing, this show, I'm showing you this. This is uh, specific work that we were doing with uh, irrigation manufacturers. And we were looking at, so what is open and closed? Because it's easy to say, we want all data to be open. We want everything we want. Why shouldn't, why should one irrigation system, why should one tractor, why should, why should one harvester, why should one soil moisture sensor be different than another? Well, because companies still want to protect some areas of what they think is the, uh, their a market advantage in their intellectual prop property. So where you see red arrows on this slide is proprietary information. Now, there might be, you might have a source that's giving you field data, they've mapped your field. Uh, uh, you might have beginning of your crop data, your sensor data, your climate data. These people might wanna send that in a proprietary format. We've worked with, with all these companies down here uh, uh, that they're now all gonna send it in a, a one standard format. So if you have sensor data from uh, uh, Campbell Scientific or another company, it's gonna come up to you say, please send me uh, soil moisture data, please send me field weather data, please send me whatever it is that they they're are, are collecting. That's gonna to come to uh, in the same format. It's gonna look the same. And so it doesn't, it doesn't, we don't tell them how to collect it. We just say, once you collect it, send it in the same way, that's great. And they were very o open. So the, so the, the, the sensor man manufacturers were very o o open to that. The weather station people very o open to that. Our problem ran into when we were getting into uh, the companies that actually have the big pivot man, uh, the big pivots. Um, and they said, whoa, wait a minute. We, once we know what you want, so, so these things all go up through an FMIS or decision support system. And they've, we talked about before, a recommendation is, is sent. And then from that recommendation, a work order is sent to the pivot. In this case, a, uh, a center, center pivot. At that point, the manufacturers are saying we will take it from there because we do not want. I, if if I'm if I'm figuring out how to turn on sprinkler heads or do this or that, that's pretty much in my ball court, and I do not want anyone else doing it the same way that I do it because I think I have an advantage in the way that I do it. So that's all of a sudden we have a, a red arrow, and so they will they will take. The work order is almost like a, rec a rec recommendation saying, put this so much water over this area of the field, but they will take that then and ex execute it. But what they will do, once that is done, they will say, okay, here's how much water we put and we will uh, over the field. We won't tell you how we did it, but we will say how much went and we'll send that in, a, uh, in an open format back, back to you. So the point here is, there are areas where we're gonna have open data flowing freely in the same format. And there's gonna be areas where manufacturers are still gonna say, no, I'm gonna do this in my own way. And that's sort of how the market works. So a lot of people say, why just, we just have everything open, everything in the same format, everything free, is because these guys are saying, I have to make money. I still have to make some, some money. And so I think we will live in this mixed environment where some data is open and easily sourced and other data is not and it's either proprietary or you're going to pay pay for it and that's sort of going to be the future for um, as far out as I can see. Okay so a few guiding principles um, for you. If you're starting to move into you using data start with the end in mind. What do, what do you want to get out of this? Are you trying to, to increase your yield? Are you trying to increase your profitability? What, so have that end goal in, goal in mind first. Write it down. What do I want to do with my farm? What's going on? And your challenge might be different than your neighbors. And take 
what I call baby steps, small steps. Do not, there's so much that you can do with, with data. I mean, we just went through just a tip of the iceberg today. There's so much you can do. Start small. Start with one problem that you're trying to solve. Start with one goal that you want, want to have. If you try to take it all on at once, I guarantee you from the experience that I've, I've worked with farmers, you're going to get overwhelmed and you're going to get frustrated. So take it small, take baby steps, build it up over time, and start where you want want to start. And start where you think you can have some, some success as well. And it may take a few years to see the full value of it. And, and if you're working with a data pr provider, be very clear with them, get in very clear writing on what data you will provide and how they will use it. And it might be that they may not tell you, oh, I'm going to take your data and I'm going to share it with larger companies who are going to pay me for that or somehow, or they're going to, you know, maybe I give them advertisement on my site or somehow a, a trade with that. Make sure you understand what's going on with, with that and make sure then you have support and use a trusted provider. And at the end of the day, particularly learn from one, one another, talk to your neighbors. Even though they may have the same problems, they may have di different problems, but learn from one another. Take takes take some time. Um, so that's who that was a lot to go through. This will be re re recorded. Uh, we have some things coming up up next uh, next week on Wednesday. Uh, uh, my good co colleague uh, Stefan will be talking about key d data for farmers. I know some people wanted to find out more about. Um, what kind of data is needed for uh, uh, dairy and herds. Uh, Stefan's going to go through more of that in his presentation. So he'll be, we've asked him to, to add that. Uh, on the 25th of March, uh, I'll be doing another web webinar we call Crossing Adanga, which is a term that came up when we were in South Africa. Uh, and it's really using data for farm operations. So today was a big over overview. On next month, we're going to get much more detailed, much more step by step. So, how do you decide what data you need? How do you map it out? How do you work with a provider? It's a much more of a detailed step by step process that hopefully you can take having gone through this overview pre presentation. And then, uh, Stephen, Stephen's going to do uh, mobile applications for farmer as a pre recorded webinar, uh, should be available uh, sometime next month. We also were trying to get some more web. Uh, pre-recorded webinars done, uh, and uh, Valeria is working on that. So, woo, that was a lot to go through. I'm going to stop and open it up for questions. So, Valeria. Thank you so much, Dan. That was really, really interesting. Thanks a lot. We, we now have already three questions in the chat, uh, and I'm going to ask you these questions. But if other participants want to ask more questions, you can go to the chat the second icon on the right, and you can type your question there. In the meantime, I will ask Dan three questions that came up. Uh, the first question is from Irina. Irina is asking, uh, data flows depend on data, but also on semantics supporting data representation. Yes. What se yeah, what semantic products would you advise to use to represent and link better agricultural data? Uh... <laughs> <laughs> um, so what 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 we do is um, what how, how we approach it in a gate, gateway is uh, to start with the data sets that that we need, and then we we look to see if there are, or, are organizations who have done those semantics. So for example, uh, we look to the um, uh, Open Geospatial Consortium and use the language and the way that they approach um, uh, geospatial uh, data as a way for us to format the data, uh, uh, particularly for observations and measurements in, in the field. So a lot of times that, that context and, and the semantics already exist, they just have not been applied to agriculture. Uh, we, we, had, we had to spend a lot of time um, translating between um, uh, equipment uh, and and field operations because equipment was uh, you know driven by ISO and uh, and and that tended to be very equipment uh, focused but not process so it didn't take in agronomic practices we actually had to do do some work 
uh, uh, creating a, a common um, vocabulary from there. So I, I can't, I don't know of a specific product. I will try to find that out and we will send that, that out um, to you. There, there, I know that some, some of the folks who work down deeper in, in the details of it may have found some products, but basically we, we go out and, and try to find does someone else have this already? And we mainly have found it in organizations rather than a specific product. Uh, maybe Dan, can I quickly add something? Because in a project where we are working, that's called God and Action, we did an overview of existing data standards for farm management. And we also worked with ACK Gateway. Because actually, I have to say ACK Gateway is the association that is more advanced in looking for standardization in this area. Uh, there are not, for instance, there are no semantic resources for describing certain, process, certain processes in farms. Uh, while there are some uh, formats that people normally use, there may be some conceptual models on which people agree, uh, but you will not find uh, an RDF, for instance, an RDF ontology. There are new experiments for that, but they are not being used in the industry. So there are uh, universities that are working on potential RDF vocabularies for that, but it's really something uh, I think still far from happening. Yeah. So yeah, and 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 for example, we we're, we worked with uh, with uh, a, a researcher in uh, J Japan and with the Open Geospatial put, put those together to say, okay, how do you talk about off observations? How do you talk about prop properties? How do you talk about a feature of a property? And so we are proposing and, and, and put out a structure on how to uh, do that. And maybe I should talk about that next month and, mm. and, and include that. But as, uh, yeah, I think Verlier is quite right. There's not, a lot of this has not been, it's been applied to technology products, is just now being applied to agriculture. And again, with equipment, it was, fa it was fairly easy. With agronomic pr practices, it's still being worked out. Good, good question. Yeah. Now we have two questions from Juanita. The first one is, what is the difference between data information and knowledge? More specifically, okay. is, da is data-driven agriculture including also information and knowledge? I would say that today, data-driven ag agriculture in theory includes all. I think, what's, I think it does include definitely data and definitely information. So you can collect lots of uh, weather data and get information about that. I think, again, I think we're missing still a lot of expertise and we're missing um, user in interfaces that makes that actionable data. So it's got to be actionable. And that's where the knowledge piece comes, comes from. And the wisdom comes from more in that pre predictive phase of using data. So what do I do with this? How do I learn from this? What what do I do next? So if you are a good record keeper and you move from season to season, year to year, you already have a lot of that wisdom in your head. But we're trying to say, can, can we add, add data to that? So theoretically, yes, it should go from data, which is just bits of of uh, zeros and ones. But it's, it's, it's really attached to particularly um, uh, information about your soil, information about the weather, information about your crop. But it's then putting it into knowledge that says, so what do I do with this? And that's where I think uh, we have some ways to, to, to go. And I think that's what individual companies are trying to do those, those mergers so that they can get that end-to-end -end spectrum and say, okay, it's fine to tell you that here's what the weather is going to be, be, be happening and here's the soil you got and so what do I do? Give, give, me a, give me a recommendation about that. And that's, I think we have, theoretically we can, we can uh, do that, but we're missing some enough experts to help you do that out in the field. Thanks, Dan. I, we, I, we have now another three questions. Uh, another one from Juanita is act actually quite challenging is I agree that data standards should be open and flexible, but are there specific criteria to ensure that data is accurate and complete? I think this is mm -hmm. one question. Then there is another even more difficult question, which is how can we increase the capacity and knowledge of smallholder farmers, particularly in developing countries, on how to better identify and collect, collect this data for their own benefit? Okay. 
Uh, so for the first one, there there are ways to to check the uh, uh, there's there's a, a quality check. Uh, right now, most of the quality check on on the data says, "Tell me where this data came came from. What was the provenance of that data? How, where where did it start from? How did it move through? It, t tell me if you are referencing, for example, um, if you're sending me data about rainfall and you're using me measurements." Are you using what standard are are you using to do that? Are you using UNREC 20? Are you using a different different standard? So just so so a lot of it has to do with where did the data come from, and there are also uh, the people on the other end who receive the data. They have they have built into their systems often um, algorithms to say hmm something in this data stream does not look right, and they'll they'll kick it out. And look at it and try to see what happened. So it's it's it happens in the streaming of the data, uh, and again, a lot of it has to do with either saying this is not this does not look right. This is this is line up with other data that we have, or uh, this source does not look like a good source of, of for for this, this data. And then um, yeah, I, I, again, I think that we need to we need to put together. Um, some teams of uh, agents, uh, perhaps university people, perhaps local extension agents, and really arm them with uh, with ways to, to go out and help f farmers. Again, I would say start small, start small, start small. Find a place to start and build on, on that. But I think that we have to have ways that either going out to the communities uh, and, and working with group of, of shareholders, perhaps, uh, perhaps you have a community that's built around a particular crop type, or um, I think, but I think working with those communities, uh, and then we actually have we've have proposed here in in, in some of the places in, in the U.S. that in a particular district, maybe all the farmers share a database, uh, and so that that collectively they can look to together at, at the data, but they own it, and they and they so they can ensure the privacy, but it takes an expert to, to come in and help them set it up. So um, so I think if we can start with training agents to go out and work with farmers and have very simple user interfaces, I think what we have today is way too com complex. It needs, to think, it needs to be almost as simple uh, as what Moses showed us is saying, hey, red, green, blue, tell, tell me what I should do. Uh, and I think that those those we have a ways to go with those. Great, thanks, Dan. Then we have another question. A uh, question from Lenin is asking: um, Are there some key guidelines on how to compensate the farmers for their the, for their data upon request? Are there some? Yeah, I, I guess it's about yeah compensating farmers for the data that they gave. Yeah. Um, there is a uh, a standard, and we included it with uh, in and we'll let me make sure that I send this to you. There's there's it's not really about how much to compensate. Uh, the American Farm Bureau came up with with a list of standards of how companies should make sure that is transparent on how the data is used. Again, I think that um, it has to do with uh, the when you as a farmer give your data to a third party, if you're following intellectual property law, it's not considered intellectual property at that point because you they just collected it. You've you've not done anything with it. And 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 I've I've talked with you know I've I'm actually t talking with with some folks here in this in, in the U.S. and I don't have an answer yet. But my my approach would be could if we had if we had a how do we help farmers or even groups of farmers. Who are together say, okay, here's here's our data. We need to do some minimum amount to that, so it does create value. And now it is a piece of intellectual prop, property, uh, and so now I'm, I'm giving you something that meets that intellectual property standard. And I am, um, I, you need to compensate this bit for me. We don't know what what that is yet. We're trying to to define it. We're trying to look at contracts that people have already. Uh, so stay tuned, but I think it's a, it's there's not a clean answer at all um, in, in this part, and it's rather fr frustrating because I think you guys 
you all do need to to you know your, your data is being used right and then sold back back to you with advice but i think that advice is based on the data that you are giving so there has to be a better way to have that comp compensation going on but there's not a clean answer yet i wish there were thanks dan now we have another question uh, another challenging one uh, Alexandre uh, says, you spoke of data delivered on third party platforms and some related risks, but it's also a means not to manage IT for a farmer. Yes. What is, yeah. What is the rate of penetration of use of cloud data and applications sold with agricultural machines, combines, etc.? Um, so the, so it it's increasing and um it's it's changing this even last year to this this year and again it has to do with how many com what other parts of the system companies are, are buying so it's 100 percent you if, if you buy a uh, a combine or tractor you're you're, you're going to have that 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 data to ha that's associated with that that will maybe you know monitor the, the yield that that you harvest and send that uh up to through the cloud to john deere or send it to you and your and your fmis i i think in america it's it's, it's um probably a 70 percent penetration rate of of data b being used and most farmers um I, now here in the united states we've had a lot of mergers of farms as well and so, so they get very big, they hire IT experts. And so then it starts becoming very easy for, for them to use farm management information systems. For smallholder farmers, uh, it's really finding the time to do it and, and finding that expertise. So some of, them will use, some of them will own part of their farm management information system themselves, uh, but then re rely on a cloud service to get advice. Uh, based on what they are are saying, so it'll be a combination of both, where part partly they they do, and that's that's a pretty common model for a, a smaller farm to say that I will, I will I will send you data for specific purposes, because uh, I have a specific question or I want a specific service from uh, you about what the weather forecast is going to be and how, how I use that for my farm, but again I think most most of it today uh, is being used, a lot is being used around seeding and types of seeds. That's a huge amount. And um, I actually have, uh, and then the, 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 two, the, two big, the two biggest uh, uses by market share today are uh, driving uh, big tractors and combines and things without, without a, a driver, so that autonomous, and then trying to get to geospatial, add geospatial data there so you can do the variable rate seeding, the variable rate ir irrigation. Those by market share are, are the two biggest um, uh, ones today. I hope I'm answering your uh, question. I think so, I think you did. I don't know if Alexandra wants to type some comments in the chat, but I think it was a very thorough answer. Uh, in the meantime, I have two uh, notes on the webinar on crossing the Donga, which is supposed to, to happen on, in March. But I think, uh, Dan, maybe we calculated uh, incorrectly because we said Monday 20, 25th of March and people are telling oh. me it's a Sunday. <laughs> so, well, it's a Sunday for you, it's a Monday for me. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> or vice versa. Okay, so it's Monday the 26th. Yeah, Monday, Monday, Monday the 26th. That. People are asking uh, also for the link to register for that, and I gave you, I gave them the link in the chat. That's the link to the page where we will publish all the upcoming webinars and the related registration re links. So you will find everything there in a couple of days. The link to register for that one is not there yet, but we will add it very soon. And, and next week, okay, we have the webinar by Stefan. And if nobody has more, I mean, thank you, Dan, because you were very generous with your time. We are over one hour now. Is anybody still waiting for an answer? Do you have a question? Otherwise, we can close the webinar. Oh, Dan, maybe you didn't have a look at the chat, but a lot of people are thanking you for your presentation oh, and for your, okay. for your I don't, answers. I don't see the chat where I am right now. So. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> they are thanking thank you. you for your answers. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you all for your, for your, for your time. Um, you know, we're all in this together. So um, we keep on keeping on. <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. I see there are no more questions. So I, would, right. close, I would close the webinar now. Thank you, thank everybody. You. And thanks, Dan, especially. Thank yep. you. Bye. <laughs>